our story begins. As we've been led through the forest, the tree branches rustling with the sounds of the chains that bind us one to another. We reach the shoreline of the kingdom of Dahomey, present day Republic of Benin. We have been loaded onto this huge ship called the Clotilde. The captain is afraid that King Lily is coming to the ship to attack him. So he leaves 15 of our tribes people behind. They load us onto the cargo hold. The door slams shut. There's only darkness. We begin to cross this vast ocean with the fear of not knowing where we are going or what awaits us and the pain of never seeing our loved ones again. The sounds of the water beating against the ship as the ship struggles through a hurricane. But there's only darkness that we can see in this slave hole. The women and the children crying out as we are packed and shackled together. Death is preferred rather than the unknown that awaits us. This was just before my 20th birthday. This is our story. America takes its first big step in stopping the importation of Africans. In 1794, the United States makes it illegal to maintain or support ships involved in the slave trade within its ports. On January 1st, 1808, the United States bans the importation of Africans. The penalty for importing Africans is still only a misdemeanor. The fines associated with being involved with the slave trade do little to deter slave traders. The fines are paltry when compared to the profits made from the importation of Africans. After seeing little success, the United States government begins imposing stiffer monetary penalties for those involved in the slave trade. Additionally, slavers would now be faced with the seizure of their ships and up to five years in prison. Despite the considerable risk, Americans continue to operate in the slave trade. In fact, the increased risk makes the slave trade a more profitable business for those involved. Very few slavers are ever caught, and of those who are caught, few are ever convicted of a crime. Slave ships begin using the ingenious strategy. Slavers simply abandon ship if they are pursued. Entire ships of Africans are thrown overboard to get rid of the evidence of the crime. The government simply cannot keep up with the slavers. In 1859, an infamous bet is made. Timothy Mayer and his brothers Jim, Byrons, and John Daphne discuss the difficulty of bringing a ship full of illegal slaves to Mobile ports. The government has been making it increasingly more difficult to import Africans through Mobile ports. Some are starting to say it's impossible. Timothy Mayer believes otherwise. He bets the group it can be done. Timothy wagers he could bring 100 Africans through the ports right under the government's nose. He bets a massive sum of $100,000. With the bet on, the men now need a ship and crew. This thing is more than a bet. It is also an investment opportunity. If Timothy is right, Anyone involved stands to make a hefty profit considering slaves are selling at a premium. With the money raised, the investors hired the best sea captain around, Captain William Bill Foster, and his crew to make the journey and pick up the cargo. The investors also purchased a ship, the Clotilda, a two-mast schooner. This ship is built by Captain William Foster himself. This ship is specifically chosen for her fleetness, cargo capacity, and speed. The ship is overhauled and refitted specifically for the purpose of transporting slaves. If any ship can make this treacherous journey successfully, this one can. War is a part of Africa. War among tribes or ethnic groups in Western Africa has become widespread practice. War is encouraged and instigated in Africa to keep the slave market open and viable. 
When a tribe conquers another, the conquered people are often sold into slavery. This encourages more conflict. War is a business in Africa. An important article is published in the Mobile Press Register on November 8, 1858. The article describes a war on the west coast of Africa. The king of Dahomey, Glili, has been running a brisk trade operation near Sierra Leone. Glili has captured a large number of men, women, and children from surrounding villages and has made them available for export. This is just the opportunity Captain William Foster and his investors have been waiting for. It is time to set sail. Captain Foster arrives on the coast of Dahomey on May 16, 1860. Foster and his men make landfall. They are immediately met by King Glealy's soldiers. Captain Foster and his men are brought before Glealy. Foster is careful not to offend this temperamental king. King Glealy proudly explains how he conquered the surrounding villages. He even used women as warriors, the Amazons, also referred to as non mictan meaning our mothers, in the Fon language by the male army of Dahomey. They are an all-female military regiment of the kingdom of Dahomey. They are also the king's bodyguards. Those who are not killed have been enslaved. All of the enslaved are taken to the stockades in Weta, stripped of all their possessions, and imprisoned. Captain Foster selects 125 young African men, women, and children to make the journey to America. Foster pays Glealy $100 for each slave. Foster and his men chain all the captives together and march them to the shore. Before being brought aboard the ship, the African captives are forced to walk around a large tree several times. The purpose for this process was for the captured Africans to forget their history, their religion, their families, their cultures, and their homeland. They are then led through the door of no return, never to see their homeland again. The Africans are then loaded onto rowboats to be boarded onto the ship Clotilda in the cargo hold. The Clotilda is the last ship to leave. As Captain Foster and his men are loading the slaves, a lookout spots something terrifying. King Glealy's vessels are approaching and they are flying black and white flags. Glealy is known to engage in piracy. Now it looks as if he's planning to steal back the African captives and keep the money. Foster needs to make a split decision and orders the crew to abandon the slaves who are not yet on board. Kudjo Kazula Lewis feared he would be separated from his brother Charlie Olule Lewis and his friend Asa Kibe, who had just loaded onto the rowboat. Kudjo Kazula Lewis yells out to the crew. Then the crew turns around and puts Kudjo Kazula Lewis into the robo. So only 110 of the 125 Africans are loaded into the cargo hold, leaving 15 on shore. Captain Foster decides to cut his losses. He immediately flees. The terror of not knowing where they are being taken, what is their fate? Forced into the dark cargo hold and forced to lay down, the door slams shut, only to lie in complete darkness. The enslaved cargo are given very little to eat or to drink, only being fed twice a day. The water was bitter because vinegar was added to it to prevent scurvy, a disease caused by vitamin C deficiency. Scurvy affected poorly nourished slaves and the ship's crew. After 13 days at sea, Foster and his men can't take it anymore. The Africans in the cargo hold will not stop crying out. The cargo hold is completely dark, too tight and the slaves are too cramped to move around or stand. Foster realizes he cannot deliver dead slaves, so he orders his men to let them out of small groups and walk them around the deck. The Africans need to move and bend their legs, otherwise they may suffer permanent damage. While on deck, enslaved cargo sees nothing but the ocean, no land in sight. They are terrified of not knowing where they are going or what will become of them. After 70 days at sea, at nightfall on Sunday, July 8, 1860, the Clotilda approaches Mobile Bay. 
not wanting to get caught by the authorities, Captain Foster directs the ship up the Spanish River. He avoids the main channels and waterways. Captain Foster then directs the ship to a secluded location on the islands of the Mississippi Sound and into Mobile Bay. Once their location is secure, Captain Foster sends word to Timothy Mayer that they have arrived. Well, things being as they were, there are some good people in this country. And, and they got the word to the government that this bet was on. So the government people were out there waiting on them along the Mississippi River. And the authorities are on high alert and begins the search for the Clotilda. Captain Foster hides the cargo in the swamps for several days. Then he and his men quickly transfer their cargo onto a steamboat. Captain Foster then sets the Clotilda on fire to destroy any incriminating evidence. Mission accomplished. The African slaves are now under the control of Timothy Mayer and his investors. The slaves are brought to John Dablin's plantation near Mount Vernon, and after a brief hiding period, the slaves are now distributed among all the investors, and some are sold to other plantation owners, but the majority of the African slaves are sent to Timothy Mayer's plantation. The federal authorities quickly find out about Mayer's bet and the ensuing illegal importation of the enslaved Africans. Mayer and his investors are arrested and charged with the illegal importation of Africans. Unfortunately, federal authorities cannot provide enough evidence to convict Mayer and his co-conspirators. The case is dismissed. After the Civil War and the emancipation, the former slaves are left to survive on their own. The Africans petition the United States government to send them back to their homeland, but their requests are denied. Eventually, the Africans decide to build their own community in the image of their homeland. Since they could not go back to their homeland, they asked Mayor to give them a plot of land. Since he was the one who brought them here, Mayor refused. So on September 30, 1872, they purchased a plot of land around Magazine Point and Plateau. The town came to be known as Africa Town. Under the leadership of Gumpa, Peter Lee, the Africans formed their own self-governing society. Disputes are resolved by a tribal chieftain. Illnesses are treated by their African doctor. The people speak their native language, have their own customs, and carry out their own tribal traditions. The men work as masons and carpenters, building their own homes. Honey is plentiful in Alabama forests, and the people are able to adapt their hunting and fishing skills accordingly. The people also planted crops. The people of Africatown formed their own self-sufficient world. The men voted for the first time and became naturalized citizens on October 23, 1868. Now, that group of people uh, were not slaves long because the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863 and the Civil War ended in 1865. So, so when they were set free, uh, they were set free on that land in which they came ashore, which is now Africa Town. Uh, the male family told them that they could take the land and live on. Well, they set up a community of their own. Now, the, they didn't know much about American law, but they knew about the law, the tribal law, where they came from. So the laws of, that they set up were based upon the laws of a tribe of, uh, uh, of a tribe back in Africa, which made them the first community in this country uh, of free slaves in which the laws resemble the same laws as a tribal as a tribe back in Africa. Kajo Kazula Lewis is one of the last living survivors of the original Africa town population. He was captured just before his 20th birthday. He becomes a spokesperson for the people of Africa Town. He shares his story. He tells of the horrific journey across the ocean, the days on a plantation, and the rise of Africa Town. Kudjo Kazula Lewis would cry profusely every time he would think about or speak about his family and villagers on how they were brutally murdered. He missed his homeland, always hoping that one day they could return. When given interviews, Kudjo Kazula Lewis would always insist that the writers use the traditional African names of the Africa town people so that families in Africa would know they survived. Kudjo Kazula Lewis died in 1935 at the age of 95. His resting place is in Africa town's historical cemetery. Story of Africa town is a very important story. 
because it's, it's a story of our resistance. And it seems that we speak a lot about um, our time of, in captivity and in forced labor camp. But we don't speak enough of all the resistance movement. Many gave their life fighting relentlessly all throughout the time of captivity till the end, till today. Africatown is one of the beacon experience to show that we can, we will not accept those terms. Haiti is another example. Maroons in Jamaica, there's another example. I was just in Brazil. We have the Minas Gerais. They were hiding in the mountain. They created community where they kept the language, they kept the rights, whatever it was. So this is why Africa Town has to be really studied and has to be exposed much more in the teaching to adults or children, but it has to be a story, a narrative that we keep on hearing about. Oh, my people, I love you. We're a family. Yeah, you and me, hey. We'll make it through it out. No matter what the cost. We're a family. Yeah, you and me, hey. We'll make it through the pain, the rain, and all the trouble by ourselves. Oh, 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 oh. My people, I love you. I love you. We are dying. We are dying. They are lying. Hey. We're being shot and hearted. Why you hate me? Trying to be, yeah. trying to be, great as I can be, great as I can be. Grow with one another, living happily, living happily. But you hurting me, but yeah. You hurt me. Why not work for peace? Why not work for peace? I am from Zion. I am a king, and you're a queen. We'll make it through it all, no matter what the cost. But we need to learn to love each other Humanity. Have a peaceful word to say Have a peaceful place for kids to run Yeah, you and me, hey We'll make it do it all No matter what the cost We're a family Yeah, you and me, hey We'll make it through the pain and rain And all the trouble by I love you, my people. I love you, my people. I love you, my people. I feel your pain, people. I feel your pain, people. We're family. Yeah, you and me. We'll make it through the pain and rain and all the suffering by ourselves.